Beijing, you are a host to the present and the gateway to the future. Hi, everyone. Welcome to episode eight of Long Time. I'm Edbert. Once again, we have Peter. Today, we're going to talk about the Olympics. So, as everybody knows, the Tokyo Olympics, which was 2020,、uh, just got wrapped up, and we're expecting the next big event would be the Winter Games. And guess where? It's going to be Beijing again.、Woo. Yes. Because of the COVID、uh, delay of the Tokyo Olympics, you know the Beijing Olympics is actually just about you know a couple months away. It's going to be hosted, I think, in February 2022, which is coming up. And this time, we're going to return once again to the Bird's Nest,、uh, mm-hmm. which was the opening, the host stadium back in 08, and、uh, the water cube, the famous water cube、uh, mm-hmm. back then, which was like the aquatic center, is now going to be turned into. The ice cube. <laughs> to host, oh, to shout host, out!、Uh, to, yeah, shout out to NWA. <laughs> right, ice cube. Yeah, yeah. We should, we should we should play a track right after this. Yeah, you know that movie. What's called motherfucker? Ice cube. <laughs> um. So, um. I think. This episode, we we just want to talk about sort of the cultural impact and legacy of the '08 Olympics in Beijing,、mm-hmm. which I think、yeah. a lot of people still remember. Okay, so、um, the Beijing Olympics. When I was a kid,、um, there were two big things that I saw on the news. People were like cheering, and I don't know what the you know what it was about.、Um, and the first thing is China, China joining the WTO, the World Trade Organization, and the second piece of news is actually. Uh, China is going to be hosting the 2008 Beijing Olympics, and everybody is looking up for it. I think that was during a period of time when China, as a country, is really、um, trying to search for approval,、um, as in like many aspects, right? Approval of the the power of the country, approval of the cultural value, approval of the people, and. Um, I think for some reason, I think the Chinese government think being able to host an Olympic is really gaining that kind of kind of gold medal of approval、um, around the world、uh, because the Olympic is such an、like, important event, and China, because of、uh, the political turmoil, has not been participating in Olympics for you know as、um, you know、uh, for a period of time. So at that time, I think it was during a period when China is really trying to get. Recognition, as in fame,、uh, across the globe,、uh, that was very intentional. So, the Chinese team really kind of、uh, successfully earning the Olympic hosting、uh, was a big,、uh, was a very big moment in the in the nation's history. I think. The games of the 29 Olympiad in 2008 are awarded to the city of Beijing. <laughs> Yeah, Among the absolutely. Chinese in Moscow, joy was unconfined. This was about the dawn of a new century, and at this moment, I think、uh, the opening up process has been going on for about 20 years or so. And so, they really saw the Olympics in 08 as a chance to showcase themselves, to to ex- to express their legitimacy. At that moment, you know, in 2001.、Um, Basically, Beijing started a massive、uh, seven-year construction effort to basically update and modernize the city to prepare for these games. And this was sort of always, this was in a way part of a, a bigger master plan development of the city.、Um, you know, for us architecture nerds out there, just want to put this out there. But in essence, the Olympics was kind of like similar to the Hausmanization of Paris in the late. Uh, 19th century, when Paris essentially changed from this kind of medieval crowded streets to these big boulevards that we see, 
And in Beijing, um, there was a similar effort to modernize the city, and such as the construction of a new subway system, refurbishing streets, and modernizing historic areas, and to sort of basically build all these Olympic venues and stadiums. And this sort of triggered a lot of increased tourism, improvements in the environments, and of course, economic growth and the growth of like advertisement and, and things like that. Yeah, and creation of cultural landmarks. Uh, which can define an era, right? Because you already have the Forbidden Palace. Everybody knows that you have the Great Wall. But what is the landmark, right, of mm -hmm. that period of time? So Olympics really kind of propel that um, in many cities. Um, in, that includes the Beijing Olympics. So, so there's a very kind of exciting role leading up to the Olympics. And I think what's uh, really important is the scale of the opening ceremony because. Um, the director of the scale um, of the opening ceremony was uh, Zhang Yimou, who is a movie director, and he was really known for the style of having a lot of uh, a lot of kind of uh, uh, temporary actors um, to to kind of throw these a uh, huge uh, crowd, big scale action scenes. I think he was really influenced by a lot of the. Uh, I think I think it was um, I think it was the work of uh, what's it called Cleopatra. Yep. So uh, he really tried um, mm -hmm. cr to create these uh, very big scenes yeah. in many of his movies. Heroes is a very good example of that. Um, there's like a shot with like a thousand soldiers, right? Um, you know, um, kind of uh, stretching the balls and ready to shoot an arrow. So uh, he kind of replicate that with the Beijing Olympic, uh, just right on the starting scene with the drummers, right? The idea yeah. is that you have to convey the sense of scale uh, with that many people on the stage. and. And it's really impressive to look at um, because people have never seen such a big show like that uh, ever. Absolutely. And to be you know, honest, um, in the past Olympics and, you know, in Sydney in 2000 and in Athens in 2004 and even in Atlanta in 96 and even uh, Barcelona in 92, um, no, no Olympics has ever really reached this kind of a scale of a spectacle. Uh, before before the Beijing Olympics and so and and on top of that the Beijing Olympics was actually coincided really with the rise of globalization and the rise of the internet and so in essence at the time this was one of the most watched Olympic games in history so there was about 4.7 billion viewers who tuned into the opening ceremony and that's about 70 percent of the world population and I think these stats kind of are only possible because of the growth of, you know, globalization and just media in, 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 in you know, back in the early 2000s. Yeah. Yeah. So it was really a big show, but also for a right time for broadcast because you have more means of broadcast than ever. Um, and, um, and the audience is crazy too, because there's so many um, people of Chinese ethnicity abroad and I think at that time, it was also during a period where a lot of Chinese Americans abroad were trying to see their culture kind of showcase in a way which is, um, you can say almost, uh, which is authentic uh, to, you know, to a Western audience. Because, uh, of course, there have been many kind of shows about China and Chinese culture. Uh, I can think of the show that comes up to my uh, head it was uh, Puccini's Opera. Uh, I'm gonna butcher this. To run dot, um, which is about a Chinese princess um, um, who wants to get this prince to um, you know not marry her because she doesn't want to get married. But my idea, the idea is that right, there hasn't been like a major um, authentic kind of representation of Chinese culture in the West. So the Olympics opening ceremony specifically was really that, and I think that was also during an age where a lot of Western cameras really kind of flew to China to really examine where that country is in terms of its developments, right? And and actually, this sort of process actually happened to other Asian countries in the past already, too. So in 1964, um, Tokyo hosted their first Summer Olympics back then. And that was really a really major cultural milestone um, in, in Japan after World War II. And the Japanese kind of use the Olympics as well to sort of show its kind of reintegration into global society afterwards and the rebuilding of Japan. 
Um, and then in 1988, uh, the Seoul Olympics in South Korea was also like a big milestone for the country in terms of how they've become a globalized country that wasn't sort of like still recovering from the Korean War in the 1950s and how they've shown themselves to be developed. And China used 2008 in, in sort of the same method as a, sort of a coming out party. Yeah. Yeah, basically a coming out party for China. Um, because really you can get to see like the stereotypes even about China was beginning to change even though like a lot of I because I was watching a lot of Western media at the time would say otherwise however I think still the country really left a really positive image uh, in terms of its support but also we want to talk about the games a little yeah. bit I mean that was a great Olympics with a lot of star athletes um, that was the game where Michael Phelps won a lot of medals. Right. Uh, Michael Phelps uh, first showed up in the 2004 Athens Olympics, but he was like a teenager. He was like 15. But then in Beijing, it was like his prime years where he, he, he swept all the categories and became like the most decorated Olympian. And, you know, Phelps ended up, you know, uh, swimming in the, the 2012 London Olympics and also the Rio games and, uh, you know, five years ago, but, uh, the Beijing Olympics was really like the prime of his career. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I also think it's because the swimming was actually the first, uh, events that happens. So it also gets a lot of attention, but also like, I think, I think that year, um, I think that year there were also a lot of pretty exciting, um, a lot of very exciting Olympians for China as well because um, you have Liu Xiang who is a track and field um, who has a track and field athlete so he won I think the first track and field gold medal for China um, in 2000 in the game of 2004 so that was actually a very big stimulus for the Chinese population because the beliefs was that okay like stereotypically Chinese are really good at badminton they're really good at table tennis but it was the first time that a Chinese athlete was able to you know beat all the other athletes in track and field even though it was like a hurdle game so um you know it was like the hurdle the hurdle jumping so it's actually not like sprinting or anything but um but still like that is a lot to a nation in which they have never won gold medal in these areas so seeing these athletes coming back, I think was also really, really important to China. I think following the Olympics and all the way years leading up to it, China put a big emphasis on, you know, Olympic education and sort of modernizing the sports infrastructure in the country to allow preparation to, to gain a lot of medals in, in this Olympics and in all future Olympics after that. But I believe China won the most gold that year. Yeah, that's really interesting concept because really you can see also one aspect of China, right? This aspect of even in the training of athletes, China was really trying to showcase its power because um, that was a, that that was a definitive year when China had a really rigorous sports program which supports its athlete to kind of win the most amount of medal, um, rigorous training, um, rigorous training, rigorous selection program. Uh, I'm very um, you can almost say it's very militarized, uh, militarized too, uh, program to really to push these athletes to achieve the best they can. Uh, so I think that's also also a really defining characteristic of the Chinese Olympics. I think that tradition actually have kept going even until today. Right, right, and you know, typically uh, the host city, the host country of the Olympics, typically wins the most medals because they get sort of like a hometown bump in in the count. And sort of the lo the host nation becomes more enthusiastic for the games, and usually the athletes perform a lot better. And you could see in the Tokyo Olympics more recently that Japan won way more medals than they used to win. So, also the first medal is skateboarding, which is really exciting because that was actually uh, a curveball. Because uh, yeah, because who would have thought it's the Japanese that actually gets to win the first skateboarding medal? So I think these are all kind of the f defining features of um, the Olympics for a hosting nation, right? So what's going to be really interesting about the Winter Olympics that's coming up is that, um, you know, traditionally speaking, um, U.S. and Canada um, and, also, um, and also European countries such as uh, Sweden are the best in like Winter Olympic Games. However, this kind of Winter Olympic doesn't really have much of a presence in China. So 
what I'm really curious to see is what you know what um, China is going to bring up in terms of its Olympic lineup, you know, to achieve these medal, um, to achieve these goals, um, the gold medals um, in this coming Olympics, because that doesn't really you know happen has that has not really happened before. But also, um, I'm really curious to see what uh, China is going to do in the world. Um, you know where the world is also being affected by COVID so much, um, yeah, and that disrupts you know, a lot of the tourism that happens to China. Um, you know that you know you can see the results on the Tokyo Olympics, obviously. So um, I think those are pretty interesting phenomena that we're going to perceive. Um, that is very different from all the other Winter Games. Yeah, absolutely, and and you know I think Tokyo really wanted to. The, one of the reasons Tokyo didn't want to cancel the games was because they wanted to still be the first Olympic Games after COVID, and they didn't want to give that spot away to to Beijing and to China, um, and so that's sort of how this delayed process happened. There's a sort of national prestige associated with it, and you're right. Uh, you know China's not naturally a Winter Olympics powerhouse. So it's interesting to see how they would respond to that, and also how the opening ceremony will change this time. You know, uh, China is no longer; it's been you know a, more than a decade since 08 Olympics, and sort of China's status and perception and I- idea of China in the world has also radically changed since 2008. So it's interesting how their opening ceremony will try to capture that. Yeah, because I think back in 08. The most defining characteristic of China is that China has the most people on Earth. You can definitely see that being reflected in the opening ceremony. But right now, I think there are a lot more readings and a lot more understanding of China than just like one sentence.、Um, so you know, it's a country with vibrant culture. It's a country. With crazy economy, a lot of manufacturing. So I'm really curious to see what China is gonna really tell, you know, in in this kind of new narrative. Because we we like in 08, right? A lot of a lot of the opening ceremony has been dedicated to China's past, you know, its past wonders, its past culture, right? I'm really curious to see if you know the Chinese, you know, show designers are going to showcase something different, something about China's future. Um, China's presence,、um, you know,、uh, right now. So I think that is actually something that I am actually looking forward to thinking,、um, to seeing. Yeah, for sure, it'll be interesting to see what the American reaction to the games will be as well.、Um, you know, I think America and China has not been on super great relationship footing lately in the past five years,、mm-hmm. and so、um, on top of that, I think. Olympic in- interest in Olympics has also been waning in the U.S. ever since the 2008 Games, and so、um, you know it's curious how Americans would react to Olympics in China once again, and their attitude towards the Olympics, and even I think the medals count in in more recent games have become the U.S. advantage have continued to shrink、uh, since the、uh, 1990s. Where they used to win a bunch more medals, but now it's more globally spread out. So, the sort of medal race、mm-hmm. for the Americans would also, I think, you could start to see a sort of a, a parity from other countries on that. So maybe it will be the first time when the U.S. won't win the most medals or something. So Japan is gonna win all the medals. Yeah, with their with their skateboarders and rock climbers and stuff. Yeah, with their skateboarders doubling up as、uh, <laughs> as snowboarders. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well,、uh, well, that that、yeah. wraps up our episode on the Olympics and the Beijing Games.、Um, thanks for listening, and I think we're all looking forward to a preview of、uh, the 2022 Winter Games.、Yeah. Yes. So please subscribe, and we'll see you next episode. Yes. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>